Hello, this is David Hilser. I'm a critical thinker, dissident scientist, and I'm here to tell you the truth about science, something university professors won't tell you, the mass media won't tell you, and certainly those science evangelists won't tell you. Well, once in a while you get a gem from a friend, and that's what happened to us in the CMPS, the Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society, with all of our critical thinkers. We got this link to a video from Eugene Ellis. He's a person that's a critical thinker that's been working in the area of expansion tectonics for many decades now. And he has found amazing gem. Well, where, where did he find it? What did he find? Well, he found it on the, El, the Link Tasmania website. Of course, there are 1,358 subscribers, probably never, ever been there. Why Tasmania? Well, if you go to the Tasmania, uh, you will find that, yes, in fact, somebody famous from there in geology was from Tasmania, and that was Samuel Warren Carey. Samuel Warren Carey is a person that, if you don't know, is what a, who I consider and many consider the modern father of Spanish tectonics. In fact, I have his book that I bought many years ago, Samuel Warren Carey, Theories of the Earth and the Universe. If you can get this, get it. It's a historical book, and I think there are less and less and less of them as people really start hooking on to this, this idea of the expanding Earth. You can buy it on used bookstores. That's how I did it. Well, it turns out that I have never seen him, never heard him speak, never saw a video of him until today. Today we have a video from 1982 from this Tasmanian, this L-I-N-C Tasmanian YouTube channel. And those guys are brave enough, those people are brave enough to put this up there knowing very well that the mainstream science does not accept expansion tectonics even today, many, many years after his death. And of course, Samuel Warren Carey was a person in the early 1990s who had passed the baton to who? Dr. James Maxwell, one of our favorite geologists, expansion tectonicists, and critical thinkers who is just out there always fighting for this theory, which just has an overwhelming um, e a plethora of evidence. Of course, never take my word. Take a, take a look at everything yourselves. That's what I did, and I was convinced. So we're going to take a look at this amazing video. I'm not going to play it all. It's 25 minutes. It's done quite well for the time, 1982, which they didn't have what we call linear editing at that time. It was pretty much film and uh, or videotape, and it was all very hard to do at those times. But it is a really great treasure. So we're going to look at three parts of this uh, video and uh, give you an idea what's about but of course I have a link below you should watch the whole darn thing because this is historic so let's take a look <laughs> There are three ways of explaining the distribution of continents. A contracting Earth. This has no supporters at present. A steady state Earth with fixed continents and oceans. Very few hold this view. A steady state Earth with plate motion. Nearly all geologists believe this. Since about 1968, the plate tectonics theory has been the favorite with most geologists to explain the movement of continents. It seems that the theory can satisfactorily explain many major questions in geology. But there have always been doubters. One such man is Professor Sam Carey, who supports the theory of an expanding Earth. Professor Carey was head of the geology department at the University of Tasmania for 30 years. He was also visiting professor at many universities, including Yale and Western Ontario. In 1956, he sponsored the highly successful Continental Drift Symposium at the University of Tasmania. This symposium helped stimulate interest in continental drift after decades of neglect or even contempt by the majority of geologists. He believed then, as now, that continents moved as a response to expansions of the Earth. But did he always believe that the Earth has expanded? No, only during the last quarter of a century. During the 30s and 40s and 50s, I taught what you now call plate tectonics. I took for granted that the Earth's uh, diameter was constant. It hadn't occurred to me anything else. But if I'd only known it, in Germany, uh, Lindemann had published his book on the expanding Earth in 1928, and uh, 
Hugenberg in 1932 and uh, Kindle in 1940, but these weren't translated into English. They weren't translated until I translated them uh, 20 years ago. Okay, I mean, just to stop right there, I want to keep going on this one section, but did you notice the books that he had? They were in German. They don't look like books, do they? This is, a, this is part of the symptom of some of the greatest science going on outside of mainstream. You know, here, they, here these things are. They're not teaching this as an alternative in schools. So here's a guy who we consider to be the modern father of expansion tectonics, showing you a bunch of books that are like stacks of stuff. Of course, Greg Volk, super friend of mine, who probably has more dissident work than anybody, he can tell you this is so true. Some of the stuff we have is literally like Xerox papers of stuff, and that's the only copy we have left. <clears throat> some of it, some really great work. So let's keep moving on here. But as I worked, I got increasing difficulty in putting the pieces together on a bigger and bigger area. You must remember that I was working more accurately than my contemporaries. Uh, I calculated hundreds, hundreds of uh, bleak stereographic projections, all by logarithms, there were no computers in those days, and uh, I made comparisons on my hemispherical table. No matter how often I tried, I could never get all the continents to go together on the whole globe. Even with these, which fit so nicely, there's still a small, small gap there, but uh, as I put more and more pieces on, the gaps accumulated, and I've got a very large gap. I didn't realise that my trouble was that my table matched my globe and not a smaller globe, which was the proper globe for that time. As difficulties increased, and I gradually became convinced that the plate tectonic model, which fits so well for these two continents, won't work for the whole globe. So you can see there, you can do that experiment. Many of us who uh, got exposed to expansion tectonics and really thought this amazing did the same kind of thing. If you take take on a globe, take take some take uh, South America and Africa together, cut them out, put them together. You're going to notice there's a gap. You can only you sort of like roll them. But you can imagine if that's on a more curved surface, a smaller globe, that that's what he was talking about. The gaps sort of disappear. And he couldn't figure out, no matter, just, and this is just simple stuff. Take, take a globe and do this. You will find out that, sure enough, this was one of the ways many of us who even just looked at the topography of continents and this whole idea that it sort of goes willy-nilly, as Neil Adams says, like, uh, you know, pancakes on a skillet moving around, that, in fact, it seems to all work much better on an expanding uh, globe. So we're gonna take another look here. I'm gonna go a little bit further. Um, I'm going to probably get a little ahead of it or a little behind, but let's hopefully this will be right where we need to see it. Force on the surface of the Earth could not have been as much as that. But Professor Stewart's argument assumes that the mass of the Earth has been constant. Well, has it? I don't think so. I think that all matter in the universe grows at a rate depending on some power of pressure and time. Then others point out that uh, if the Earth was shrunk to half its diameter with only the continents, they would be drowned to great depth by all the ocean water. There'd be no land surface at all. But this assumes that the water was always there, was it? I don't think so. At a very early stage in the Earth's history, the Earth lost all its water, all its gases, all its vapours. And our present atmosphere and the present oceans have accumulated through geological time, partly from emanations from volcanoes, but mostly from the new volcanic ro rocks coming up on the ocean floor for the growth of the oceans. So that there's a direct link there. The volume of ocean waters has kept in step with the area of the oceans. That's quite amazing, and, and, and that's a question I often got uh, by people who say expand te expansion tectonics is correct. Well, what happened to the oceans? Well, there were shallow seas during uh, when all of them were together, about 240 million or 220 million. Uh, don't get me on those numbers, but around that time, 
the current crust started breaking apart. Well, where was all the water? Well, the water was in shallow seas, and there's a lot of geological evidence for this. Where did the water come? Well, when I was a kid, and they were really getting down in the ocean in the 1960s and 1970s, when I was growing up, I got National Geographic, and one of the things you saw, what these I saw, remember, they called them smokers. Smokers were like these little underground, little teeny volcanoes along the ridges where the Earth was is expanding, and what was coming out of it? What was coming out of it? Water. No one ever seemed to even think about that. Well, where does the water come from? That's where it's coming from. So that's quite quite an amazing thing. He also talks about the mass increase. And in this, I'm not going to show you at all because I want you to take a look at it yourself. But he also actually goes in 1982, looks at Mercury. And he looks at Mars and says, look, expansion tectonics is happening there too. That's quite amazing. To me, I'm totally blown away because... The first times I heard about that was from uh, Neil Adams. Now, other people I'm sure have come up with those same conclusions, and Neil Adams has some really great, uh, if you want to see, look at Ganymede and other places, other uh, Saturn's moons. Man, are there some great graphics. Take a look at Neil Adams, look at him up. It is fantastic. We're going to take a look at now the uh, ending of this because I don't want to spend too much time on it because, uh, again, I want you to watch it. But I'm going to go see if I can get to this to right to the place where we need to go and take a look at this. It was into this century when people all knew that the continents were fixed on the face of the Earth. And it's only in the uh, 60s that it's generally been accepted that the continents have moved over the surface of the Earth relative to each other, even though Wegener knew this 50 years before. And now it's 50 years since Hilgenberg and Lindemann knew that the Earth was expanding. And now it's your turn to realize that the Earth is expanding. May I quote from Alexander Pope? Be thou the first true merit to befriend, his praise is lost, who stays till all come in. Well, I'll tell you, that's, that's quite an amazing video. I can sort of get a little emotional about it because I, I can imagine, you know, uh, he was a fighter. He had to fight this. This was not accepted. It's still not accepted today. And again, as I always say, you know, don't take my word for it or anybody's word for it. What do we all do? We all take a look at the data. Even geologists who really even make a living at uh, how plate tectonics is said to work with subduction and, and all of that, even they say there's a lot of, there's almost overwhelming evidence for an expanding Earth. But things take time to, to move, literally. You think the continents and the Earth's expanding at a, at a slow rate? It's not. It's expanding pretty quickly compared to geological time. But it certainly is not, not our, our movement of theories of new and better models of the universe, whether it be, in this case, uh, expanding Earth, and where we have to say, okay, mass is increasing, we're going to have to accept that. How do we have to have physical models that explain that? Almost everybody in the dissident world today, our model, the particle model, ether models, the lattice models, the action at a distance models, almost every person working on models that I consider to be very good models, even models that are mostly uh, equations and different types of models like um, uh, jo uh, uh, William Lucas, Dr. Bill Lucas, he also talks about uh, how you know, mass gains and the, the Earth expands. Everybody outside the mainstream has to, to address this. Now, this is very different. And guess what? Our models, which actually do, do a lot better at other things like explains gravity and light and gives physicality to magnetism and, and explains the double slit with detector problem where it's a, lights, a, lights a wave, lights a particle, those kinds of things. All of those things also have to take to account these things. So it's really pretty amazing to be in this world right now because you really feel like you're in a, 
a tectonic, excuse the expression, a tectonic shift in science. We are in a very exciting time. We have competing models. Which one's going to win? We don't know. But we've got some really good ones, and I'll tell you, they're much better than mainstream models. But again, don't take my word for it, especially on expansion tectonics. Look for yourself. Look at the data. Look at the videos. Read about it. There's a lot of information. In fact, if you go to wiki, wiki.naturalphilosophy.org, put in expansion tectonics, you want to learn about it, you have what is considered, in my opinion, written by James, Dr. James Maxlow, an encyclopedic, the first fully encyclopedic article about expansion tectonics. But again, this is so amazing that we have this video of Samuel Warren Carey who actually took the time to make this video and he did not have any problems fighting because he was not popular on this. This is sort of not taught. Well, it's not so it isn't taught. So if you if you learn plate tectonics, my daughter did not learn about uh, he he learned she learned about all kinds of things with plate tectonics, but you never heard expansion tectonics even given the time of day. This is back in '82, and we're still fighting today. So don't take my word for it or anybody else's on faith. Stay critical, stay thinking. I'm Dave DeHilster. I am your science therapist. Ciao for now.